Just love yourself, baby. That's all I got for you. Embrace you. Uplift yourself. Speak love, sweet words to you. The quote that this lady said. Um, are you allowing people to speak sweet words of honey to you? Mm. That's all I got. Appreciate y'all tuning in this week. Whoa, chair almost dipped on me. So uh, I figured I'd come outside, get in the sunlight. It's beautiful out right now. How many days did you actually get off to come outside and enjoy it? Um, listen to the birds. I love coming outside, listening to the birds. We got a bunch of bird feeders all over the place and it allows us to interact with the animals uh, and they provide a lot of pollination, uh, moving things around. Uh, we got bees out here. Um, there's squirrels. You get to see them in their natural habitat running around doing like acrobats, you know, and, and like they're gymnastics. And, you know, it's just a beautiful thing. We even got groundhogs that pop up once in a while and rabbits. And so I just wanted to come out and enjoy it, see the garden a little bit. So I'm gonna hop in about this book this week. Literally took me the whole week. And it's called I Am Diosa by Christine Gutierrez. Give me one second, I'm gonna talk about it. I appreciate you joining in to Modern Nobility. Um, got a bike going fast. Oh, we got a couple bikes. Got a car and stuff like that. Hold on one second. Close your eyes, just listen. Soothing when you hear that engine. All right, cool, cool. So I appreciate you joining in to Modern Nobility this week. Uh, and if you don't know what that is, it's a podcast that I created to um, to film me and to journal my process from reading 100 books in 90 days. My attempt, anyway. Uh, so far, I'm at uh, 12 books. Um, I started my 13th book yesterday. Um, I'm on like the third chapter. Uh, it's, it's only 100 pages. I could probably read it in about a day or two, depending on what I'm doing. And um, it's a really good book too. But yeah, I'm on 13 books. It's journalizing um, the, the the path of me going through um, just my journey, just seeing how I'm going to be after reading 100 books, right? They say that if a average person reads typically four books a year um, because they're on and off and they just never like really get into it and they just, you know, put it down and it just, it just passes them by. So I, I decided to take cliff notes um, audio books and get books, physical books, and test myself and see what happens if we do devour and absorb, absorb that much information in a short amount of time. What happens to us? If you do it in a year, what would happen to you? The average CEO of a company, um, they typically read between 50 to 60 books a year. So in their mind space, they're searching for information because they know that someone before them has done this so why not be humble and listen to the views and aspects of what they've discovered so that they don't make the same errors uh and in that suit of information and knowledge i'm pretty sure at that point they become more intelligent um got a plane coming through and that they're able to assess things from the leadership side of the perspective and also work around people so i started with fiction um this week i'm talking about um psychology really touchy book. I went into depth about a lot of different things and I'm just gonna tell you real quick um, what you're gonna be basically listening to. Um, so basically I said that this book is gonna take, it took me the whole week to read and listen to. It's about psychology. I'm glad that I read this book just to give you some insight on what you'll be listening to. I'm going to break down some barriers and normalize men talking about their trauma. So today I'm gonna talk about my trauma too and how I've overcome it and and the man that you see before you, and um, and it might it might make you look different. Be like, oh snap! I didn't know he went through all that. But you know what? I want to normalize it so people can start talking about it because women talk about it. They go to therapy. They go to their psychologists and things like that and that nature, and they get help. But men hardly ever seek out help, right? So I want to normalize it so that you don't feel fame, uh, shame and keep it inside, and you you have this like you know, facade, this macho facade, because you have to be masculine, right? And, you, and your vulnerability is going to challenge that. So I'm going to talk about that. We're going to help you out. 
Um, so it's about breaking down some barriers and normalizing men talking about their trauma. Um, this is basically what I'm talking about today. So uh, stay tuned and listen in. All right. Uh, the theme, the journey is to healing deep, loving yourself, coming back home to soul, as well as breaking free from self-sabotage. And this is the book about I am Diosa. There's a lesson about soul work, which is a spiritual retreat that takes place with inside. Diosa means goddess in Spanish. Here comes this part. La Diosa, meaning the goddess, can give you strength, inspiration, and empowerment. Everyone can draw from La Diosa, as she is more than just a feminine divine, but she is Mother Earth. The reason why the seed becomes the plant. So this is the quote that she says, that Christine says. The reason why the seed becomes the plant. This is you, the female, the male, the non-binary, gay or straight. Saying that everyone can pull from this. Doesn't matter from what walk of life you are. Whatever happens, whatever happens to you in life, you can always alchemize yourself. And basically, this is the process. Oh, oh, switch on note. This is the process of transforming a natural ingredient into something magical, like taking lead and turning it into gold as that alchemy side. You can always be made anew. That's very true in a lot of ways because you can always restart, you can always refresh. She talks a lot about that too in the book as well. This is something that you may not know that psychology is the study, the study of the soul and not the mind, right? So a lot of people talk about that, that you think psychology is of the mind and what's happening, but in reality is of the soul, your your whole spirit, the whole essence. All right, uh, this is, uh, so she talks about this woman, uh, Dr. Clarissa uh, Pinkolas Estes, who's a big mentor to her. Um, and she basically says, this is her quote, uh, uh, Dr. Um, Estes, that psychology is literally the study of life of soul. Psychology is also connected to the breath and the animation force of life. That, that, I was just like, I need to write that quote down and remember it. And that's why I was talking about the journal, journaling this path to see how, where I come from root. Start base one, all the way from the 100th book. What happens to me? Do I, like, is it like the spiritual journey that I'm going to take that path on? We're going to find out, right? So psychology is also connected to the breath, the in, uh, the breath, the animation force of life. Christine mentions in a book that she draws her experiences relating in the fields of shamanism, tantra, cognitive behavior therapy, and cultivating sensitive approaches to therapy. Looks like the sun went away. You hear the cop car in the back. Here's another section where Christine mentions about her experiments as a therapist. That she has the mindset that these are basically her theories and what she her 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 practices and what happens when she's um, engaging with her clients, right? So that she has the mindset her clients who who come to her to see her for help have wisdom stored within themselves, and that all she does is create the space that allows them to discover what was already there. Her approach in psychology is from a sisterhood perspective. Very powerful. The practice of shamanism is the bridge between both worlds, the ordinary world and the spiritual world. What a shaman does is to allow to bring back a person's spirit back into their body. As a therapist, Christine would call this a moment of disassociation, but shamans believe that a person is temporarily disconnected from their body due to whatever trauma they've experienced. The beauty of this ancient practices of spiritual connections are now being backed by modern day scientists. So that, that's why she wanted to basically, as I, I took from the book that she wanted to do a, a, a non-traditional way of being a therapist versus how it is today where, and I'm not attacking anyone in this, in this um, approach, but she was just saying that there could be too much things that are going on that we, sh we could probably saw more 
of by going more spiritual side, looking at more angel remedies and allowing yourself to heal that way and giving yourself rituals. That's what she talks about in the book to go away from the traditional way and try to introduce um, different religions, cultures, uh, practices of ancient uh, history that we, we like. There's another part that she talks about mantra and I'm going to go about that in the book. Let me see right here. We're just going to come on over. There are three archetype journeys that happens when you embark on change. The departure, the initiative, initiative or initiation, and the return to soul. So it's the departure, the initiation, and the return to soul. The departure, the unknown process, which is the result of leaving your surroundings or going on a trip to escape to find yourself. This kind of almost reminds me of like the story of... Uh, uh, of the Odyssey with Odysseus, right? You, you look at an Odyssey versus a trip. A trip is that you're taking a break. The Odyssey is that you're looking to alter your life that you wish you don't have and, try, and change it into a life that you wish you do. The terminology that she uses for the departure is like an undone puzzle where none, where now you can choose Pardon me, I'm going I'm to rephrase that. The terminology that she uses for the departure is like an undone puzzle where now you get to choose how to put back together and where the pieces go. After, your, after you face your demons, the... There you go. After you face your demons, the imitation is complete. Or initiation is complete. The third party is the interrogation. The conclusion you have to make that you have made of the departure and the journey that helps you embrace all of you to return back to soul. To recap this lesson is like this is my quote and, and my uh, uh, to recap what I just listened to at that point. To recap this lesson, this is like yin and yang, the equally yoked parts of shadow. Run that through. To recap this lesson, this is like yin and yang the equally yoked parts of shadow and light within the side of, inside of ourselves. Yet once you make the proper steps to venture out for change to alter your real truth, you will find completion in yourself, but also in your soul. So that that's what I took from what she said and I recapped it in my own words. Uh, here's another step in a chapter that she talks about. It's the process of healing. How we heal is a necessary process but be compassionate with yourself. I had to learn this myself um, because I took more of the the approach of self healing more than you know going to the therapist. But I've been to therapy and done that before, ten years ago, longer than that actually. But listening to that approach, I found it was more easier for me to take the self healing approach. And she's trying to give you rituals in the book itself and practices where you can do this by yourself. But if you need help, go seek a therapist. Go seek professional help. Um, how we heal is the... Okay, I already read that. Pardon me. Um, those, deep, those deep, dark places within yourself are scary, but you're not alone. If you don't have friends, family, or loved ones, then I'm here for you. That's, that's just me saying that. I'm here. Need help? Questions? Want to talk about it? I've been here. I'm trying to normalize it. Uh, here's a quote that she says. Breaking unhealthy patterns and healing your wounds require that you first acknowledge that they exist. So you, you can't just, you can't mask them over, right? You can't be like, that's not real. That's not really there. Oh, that's not my issue. When you do things of that nature, this bike's out here today. They out today, I love it. They love the weather, right? So, you know, basically going into that, you can't mask over this. Meaning, don't suppress them. Step one, find and fix the emotional feelings first. They tend to be the root of a lot of current and underlying issues that you're experiencing in your life. This tends to lead us into unhealthy habits, relationships, or situations that lead us learning milder, pardon me, that tends to lead us learning mild adaptive behaviors or patterns probably pronounced that wrong but anyway we're gonna keep moving keep moving <laughs> um it's maladaptive there you go so um go right here 
these patterns will lead you astray and could ultimately find you in an, an abusive relationship with people and yourself. You may find yourself abusing drugs, sex, and alcohol. There are many different situations and scenarios that you may be living due to mild adaptive issues. These are coping mechanisms of addiction. Awareness is the key to unlocking doors, a pathway of healing from blind actions. You have to become your own soul doctor. Find or seek help if you can't handle this task alone. So that's another part that she goes in and she's talking about. You need that we we are our own soul doctor at times. And that it's healing starts with us first, then going to seek help, right? Or going to seek help, vice versa. But that's what she's going into that part when she's mentioning about the when she's mentioning about the maladaptive um issues and intuition. Uh, issues that are happening. There you go. Got a little tongue tied there. All right. So, uh, what wounds? Here's a question that she really asked, and, and it goes over. I'm gonna pause for a second. She says, "What wounds in yourself need love?" So, write them down. Find out what what issues that you have. This is something that she told in the book that she, she talks about and something that I'm just going to tell you. Write them down, find out what the situations are, and go over them. Figure out ways that what, what issues in yourself are underlying the problem. Maybe you didn't have a father in your life. Maybe um, you had a, uh, an, abuse, uh, an abusive um, relationship, an abusive parent. It, it could be anything. Whatever the issue is that inside you, that your insecurity that you don't love, Find out what that issue is, write it down, and figure out how you can solve it, how you can add to it, how can you get out of that situation to where you are loving that part and healing that wound. Uh, here's a person that, in the book, his name is, uh, this is a quote that she takes from a guy named Roger Welsh. He provides three great tools to avoid. One, never condemn your emotions as bad, wrong, or evil. And this is what I'm gonna say. You want to keep your emotions neutral. Two, don't suppress your emotions. This will not heal you emotionally or physically. Christine says trauma lies in the body and that crying heals the soul. You need to express yourself. The shamans believed that practicing expressions of tears were the flowing river to your soul. So cry guys, cry women. Men are the ones, this is why I was saying one of normalizing um, trauma because the expression side, you out of anyone you probably know, there's probably a lot of men that will refuse to cry because they found that it, they find that it can be, it's, it's showing weakness. That's not the case. Actually holding it in is probably your weakness. Because now you're, you're trying to self, um, self medicate to fix those issues in a lot of other areas in your life. And it could be a lot of different things. This is a good time to find healthy rituals that you can practice daily to heal yourself. There are some great practices in the book, such as examples of creating a space to exercise your safe place in the form of an altar. I'm very familiar with this form of meditation since it was something that I was exposed to during my upbringing. Most of you may not know this, but my mother is a spiritual coach and I'm used to the forms of what she's talking about as having an altar. And in a lot of religions, they probably do this um, from what I can remember, Catholic religions, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, basically, there is an altar of candles and you go and light the candles. There's a ritual about it. I don't know what step by step, but it's another form of what she's talking about is that as rituals, you can create your own personal altar and use objects in your life that resonate with you and or um things that are in the nature of like maybe put a rock or crystal or uh, some branches some leaves uh, a feather anything in that in that sort to to center you to whatever you're trying to find completion in and then you can light yourself a candle you can medicate uh, meditate at it and it's the same situation what happens uh as in the catholic religion when you're lighting the candles and you could correct me if i'm wrong um, when you're lighting them, you then at that point you're doing worship and you're praying 
and you're you're going into a form of medica uh, meditation and you're you know finding trying to find answers from God, right? And in this say she's sitting there saying you're trying to find answers within, find your inner your inner voice, and then that sort of using the altar, and that's what she means. So I'm familiar with using that as a form. Um, she taught me the ways. She taught me the ways of peaceful meditation and the power of an altar. That's with Christine and also my mother. Your mind is your safe place. This is what she's talking about, uh, Christine. I often use nature and music. Oh, sorry. This is what I'm talking about. I didn't wrote down so many different things. Um, in this case, I'm saying your mind is your safe place. That's what she says. But in my and what I say is I often use nature and music for my forms of meditation. If you prefer your home, then find a clean space to dedicate to your altar and decorate it with things that resonate with you to that resonate with you in your center you. Right? So I'm gonna read that last part again. Then find a clean place to dedicate to your altar and decorate it with things that resonate with you. And that's what I was talking about just prior. Christine calls this method your soul altar. She also recommends meditation apps to help you in your exercises, but you can also use soothing music. This is my example, you use soothing music or the form of yoga to express yourself in a, a safe place. I took a class of uh, yoga, it ain't no joke. Tap in, ain't no joke. Um, these practices will ease your anxiety. So I, I probably know a lot of people that um, suffer from anxiety. It's a real thing. Um, and so based off of anxiety and depression, those are probably the two most common things that this whole world experiences at some point in time because happiness, it, it, can, it can't, it, you could have happiness to some sort where it's just balanced, but happiness can't be a rise. It can't, can't just keep going up. There's going to be ups and downs. That's why you have seven days in a week. And most people say Wednesday is the hump day, right? So you're going to get like, oh, okay, okay. Oh, it was like a little bad. Oh, it was good. Oh, oh, no, no. And then you're just going throughout the week. So there's going to be at some point that you're going to experience some kind of form of depression or sadness. And you're probably going to experience some kind of anxiety about something. My safe space is a stroll through nature with music to accompany me. I love doing it. I love taking a stroll through the park, um, uh, going to see the horses, um, going to just a trail, just see some some landscape. I find that nature and, and animal music is very soothing to the soul. Like, it just allows me to tap in to, I don't know, like, if you ever just walk out, go to the park, get a, a blanket, lay down, and then just, just look at nature. Just look at the beautiful things and then look at the trees, look at the, the noise it, that it makes when it's windy. Look at the sounds, look at the uh, uh, the animals that are running around. There is a whole movie happening outside that we are not tuning into. Like you can really find entertainment just in that. And I find it really peaceful. I like to do that when I get a chance. Um, or I go hiking, that's another good thing. Lastly, for the third lesson, you want to avoid inflaming your different emotions. This book is a great read. You should definitely add it to your personal library. Um, I, I have a goal one day to take a library uh, whenever, you know, in a section of the house, um, build a whole shelf and deck it out. Like my whole like man cave kind of thing, but it's just, it's gonna be the lavatory of knowledge. And um, it's, it sounds cool, right? It sounds nerdy too, but anyway, I just wanna deck that out and I wanna have, I want this book to be in it and you should add it to yours as well. These are the lessons of great minds that alter our behavior the same reasons i decided to change my trajectory this is now this is this is me coming in talking about uh, modern nobility if you haven't heard about it this is the creed of modern nobility a word i coined the very essence in the making of a genius greatness extraordinary noble integrity unique and successful that's my creed emotional triggers we're gonna hop back in the book these are the real life nightmares that are triggered by live events that make you feel as if the past is very much still current and present. Remember, you are enough. You are good enough in every way. I wanna pause for a second. This is where I'm gonna hop in and talk about um, 
my experiences and normalizing and helping men uh, come in and, and talk about their situations, wh whether it's if it's in the chats, um, wherever you see this at, um, or if you want to direct message me, whatever, we can have a conversation. I want to pause for a second. I want to talk about my experiences uh, and my emotional triggers, uh, my forms of what I've experienced through PTSD. I want to it's the healing side. Um, so I want to normalize men talking about trauma because it's the healing side we need, not this macho man facade as if we don't feel pain or we can't experience or be hurt or show any form of expression other than whatever else we're showing now. If we're not showing that emotional side, that heartness, that 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 tap into, um, I, I feel pain, that I need help, that side, that's what we need. That's That's the loving, we need that loving side as well uh, and instead of just saying, hey, you got to be a man. Uh, you know, I understand that from that perspective. And that's what we always been taught for so long. But just because it's been done doesn't mean it's right. I want to say this again. My vulnerability does not challenge my masculinity. Remember that. Repeat that. Say it as many times as you have to. I want to take you back to when I was a child in elementary school. Words like stupid and retarded used to irk my soul. I had a learning disability at the time that most people didn't know because I wasn't diagnosed yet. But anyway, I'm going to talk about it. My teacher at the time who said some words that stuck with me, they still, they're still there in moments, but I'm going to tell you about them. This was the same emotional trauma that motivated me to make something of myself. A time I was angry at the world for a lot of reasons. I was literally judged by the book of my cover because of my IEP. If you don't know what the IEP is, um, I'm not gonna go in the terminology terms of it, but basically it's, uh, um, it's a, a stack of papers, um, doc um a document to talk about what your learning issues are or whatever it is in school that you're having challenges with and the teachers uh, the school district and everything else supposed to have access to this so they know that you need additional help in certain fields uh, it can mean a lot of other things too I'm gonna shed some light on some stuff and it might be hard for you to listen to but this is my truth and it made me strong the same courage that allowed me to talk about my trauma so I can normalize a safe space for men and women who have experienced the behaviors that I went through. So let's, so let's pick back up where I left off. I'll never forget these words. My teacher stood right in front of the classroom and told me in front of the classroom, wait for a second take a pause it's a lot of activity outside it's pulling up a lot of um just talking about this um this subject it, it it's like almost yesterday that's why she talks about emotional triggers when she's sitting there saying that when you have something that is it's it, it runs a course alongside you because of something that you experience that you may not have yet let go but i use it in my form because I've gotten over it plenty of times over, but I still use it as my motivator because of what she said. I'll say it right here. She stood in front of the classroom. I'll never, she stood in front of the classroom and said that I will never amount to be anything. That I would be just like my father, a generational curse of being broken. Boy, was she wrong. She didn't really know anything about my father. But at the time, there was a lot of stuff that was in the news. I ain't going to talk too much about it. But it was a lot of stuff in the news. And um, I'll, I'll go on uh, parts about this. But it was a lot of stuff in the news. So she heard about it and just tried to judge me or based off of um, based off of little black boys that don't have fathers. So you're just going to keep uh, circulating in the steps of process that you might have kids. They're not going to know you and so forth and so forth. That's when I learned to face a real evil. True evil. 
these words cut me so deep and hurt for so long. But I refuse to let her be right. Call me arrogant if you like, but I was a survivor. See, I'm going to dig deeper. I'm going to I'm going to really talk about some real trauma. You might look at yourself differently and you might view me differently, but I'm a motivational speaker and I'm here to uplift, embrace and love you in ways that no one else has. I'm going to reach deep and touch pieces no one else has. I'm going to say it one more time. I'm going to reach deep and touch places no one else has. I want that to ring in your ear. Feel my passion. This is pain speaking, but love talking. I'm here to speak facts, no fiction. I'm here to speak facts, no fiction. I'm here to tell you a story that we all have deep inside. Some of us may have never experienced this before, and I hope you never have to. But listen, because there are people out there that have, and and I'm speaking to you. I want you to understand something. I love you, and I'm here for you. I'm going to embrace you in ways that most people can't even say. So not only was I humiliated and scarred in front of my classmates, but I was betrayed once again by someone that was older than me. Someone who was trying, who was supposed to protect me. I'm gonna tell you my story real quick and about what was happening in the news. So my father was murdered in front of me. That's already traumatic in itself, right? And I, and I, I went, I can't just show you me now. I can't to, to, to tell you from uh, step A or, or step one to where I'm at now, it took a lot, a lot. So I'm, I'm, it took a lot for me to get here, right? So he was murdered in front of me. I remember what gunshots sound like. I'm not gonna go into depth about it because I want to leave this story in my book when it ever is published. So that was the beginning of my PTSD. A loss of a father, something that devastated. Okay, hold on. So that was the beginning of my PTSD. A loss of a father, something that's devastating to little boys. Little black boys at that. I, I almost lost my hearing and I did not speak until four years of age. I had to go through painful surgeries to improve my hearing due to the incident to due to the incident at almost three years of age i had to learn how to talk during months months of speech therapy that still give me issues so i, I still do have a little lisp or whatever and I, I i mumble on words and i i don't know if that's due to that form of trauma that i went through um and i did almost lose my i almost lost my hearing i lost uh I can't tell you which side because I, I took a lot of practice of building my sound up and they're very sensitive. So, I mean, if you ever see me, I'm just wearing headphones. It's just that I need the dampeners. I just, it's just too, too much static going on because of the loud noise that I experienced at a young age. So I lost like 40% in one year and 60% in the other year. And it took like, I don't even know, maybe a whole year after surgery, two years maybe. I went through the surgery. It didn't go well. I had to get another surgery. It was a lot of painful um, situation because having your ears worked on and at a, especially at that young age is not a good experience um and then to actually then go through that and uh have to then learn how to test different sounds not only was i bullied every day as a student by students every day i remember my mother was like why am i every every time i'm getting called down to the office like you always there what is happening I would come into school and within after by uh, breakfast time, maybe 45 minutes in, I, I'm in I'm in a fight with somebody or something was going on. It was just like that. It was just crazy. So not only was I bullied every day by students, but as well as my teachers. And she was one of them. I can't remember her name because she doesn't deserve that space in my mind. But I remember her face. 
I remember the silhouettes of her face. I remember the the stank look, the 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 evil tone, the the demeanor. I, I won't forget that part. I'll tell you another story real quick. So as I explained, I had a learning disability. I'm dyslexic and I wasn't diagnosed until I was 16 years of age. So to go th from uh, what third grade, third grade this happened, second, third grade to 16, I was what, 10th grade, uh, 11th grade, I think it was 10th or 11th grade, I found out. To then know that all these years, that was what my issue was. This is why when I looked at a book, the page would spin upside down and letters would start dancing. Why I couldn't focus my mind. Why why at a young age, you know, after going through all these uh, traumatic experiences, to then for the, what they thought that could help me is that they needed to medicate me. That's the first thing they do to you. And I don't know if that's due to um, your makeup, right? Because they, it's just, it's just their liberty target to black um, community. Because where does this trauma form into addiction that you start introducing it at a young age? I shouldn't have been on eighteen different medications. That just, that just sounds outrageous, right? So, you know, I went through all this stuff and having these medications that were. Uh, messing with my uh, growth. Um, you know, I was really skinny and small, so everyone thought they could just try me every day. I was shy, um, you know, reserved, and for a good reason. And I had anger in places that I didn't know how to express because I had lost someone and experienced the trauma firsthand. Like, you know, so it's things like that of that nature that I couldn't explain to you. But then go on to then be bullied for that because I was shy or I was, you know, this quiet little boy. And, and then on top of that, have teachers that show that form of hate. Look, after I reached um, uh, high school, I found, and it, even some parts of middle school too, I started finding some teachers that I could actually trust. And you, sh you shouldn't as a child um, have to know if you can trust your teacher or not. That, that shouldn't be... That, sh that should not be uh, a situation that you have to come into. And if you do, speak up. I, sp I spoke up. I couldn't fight all my battles. My mom did. But I shouldn't have went through that not one time, but uh, uh, three, except, uh, three different um, situations with adults that were older than me that were supposed to be in a place of educational or um, a chaperone uh, situation that are supposed to protect me not abuse me right so i was in class during the third grade another teacher of mine knew about my issues she knew that i couldn't read but she loved to torment me she would call on people in class randomly to have them read she usually chose the most strongest readers because they she knew they wouldn't have an issue but she wanted to at least test us but she knew what my real issue was or at the time, she really probably didn't because I wasn't diagnosed with uh, being dyslexic until 16. But they knew I had some kind of learning form of disability. So she loved to torment me. She would call on people randomly in class to have them read. Every time she would call on me, she would embarrass me, make fun of me, say things like, class, see, he can't read. This is what you don't want. This is what you don't do. There was no safe space for me. No learning curve when I was surrounded by hyenas. You shouldn't raise your hand to say, hey, I need help. And then feel bad that you're asking for help. So when they would tell you, hey, if you have a question, raise your hand, I wouldn't raise it. Because I knew that if I did, it was just another, um, another moment that they could use it to attack me for a weakness that I had and exploit me and abuse me and make fun of me. I shouldn't have I shouldn't have to go through that. I shouldn't have had to go through that when I was uh, of that age. And I, I, even now I'm angry about it because I can defend myself now, but I couldn't defend that little boy then. So that little boy is still in me at some places. I can still, I still feel his emotions. I still feel his pain in certain areas. 
I still know what he went through. But I know that I came so far and this, this man you see before you, I'm not that little boy no more. But I shouldn't have been in a situation where I wanted help and I needed help and I felt bad asking for it because I was going to be made fun of. Man, that was tough. That was tough growing up. That was tough going to school. I hated it. I'll tell you another story. So when you have an IEP, you have someone who is supposed to be at the school. Well, this was during my time anyway. You're supposed to have someone like a chaperone to make sure your needs are being taken care of and that you're being protected. Well, that was far from the truth for me. And I'll tell you why, this is the third incident. Well, once again, for the third person who was older than me that let me down, they betrayed me. He was so worried about keeping his job that he let me fall behind and between the cracks that people avoid stepping on. He even allowed the bullying to continue. How could you? He was like a TS worker, I think. I forgot exactly what they're called, but I had this guy, I remember him. And I'd be like, they beat me up. Like, I'd be in the yard, and he was, like, watching, making sure that I was fine out. And uh, and I knew I was about to get bullied. And this was at a time, like, you know, I, I was like, I'm 5'2 now, right? And I'm pretty big. I'm, like, 160, 170 pounds. And, and I'm solid. I'm stocky. And most of it muscle, but I got some fat on me, too. Um, and to think about a little boy who's, what, 7? years old eight years old seven years old in that between that age and i'm like four and i'm a little boy so you, you know you're supposed to be you're supposed to be like a small sized child like right? you're not supposed to be like this massive man at that that age but you know i was sm i was a lot smaller than kids my age so i was an easy target and i was like i was like four nine height size and i was like 90 pounds soaking wet and I would, I would just remember me running to him, knowing that they were about to get me. And I'd be like, help. And he was just like, oh, that's just kids being kids. That really stuck with me. Then he knew what was happening. And then I kept trying to report it. And he was just like, trying to like, basically, essentially... Uh, shield the situation and made it in that sense that he felt oh hey how you doing <laughs> you can just leave it right there do you too so essentially you know I remember just being in school at the time and I was like you know running for him for help and it's essentially telling him about the situation and I was making complaints about what was happening with the teachers and tell him and, and he just I thought I, I thought he had my interest at heart because that's what he was supposed to be there for and watch out for me and I thought he was putting in the files for this and he wasn't so I didn't really tell my mom about it until later until she found out because she was like why didn't you tell me and I was like well I, th I thought I could trust this man I, mean, I couldn't trust the teacher, so I thought I could trust him. And then I find out he was another enemy. He was another person that was going to betray. I was like, damn. How? So then she found out, and then, you know, they got him out of there and got me another person to come in and watch me. And they did a lot better. They did a, a way better job. They, they didn't let that stuff fly. And, you know, that could be just the weakness of people who was afraid. I don't know. I'm not afraid. Anyway, so I said, how could you? This was another lesson that I learned from the book, Handmaiden's Tale. Speak up in the eyes of tyrants. But see, he was a coward. He allowed fear in and let me be abused. I hope this normalizes men talking about their trauma and the women who are afraid because of the whiplash. So not only was I betrayed by people who were older than me, these were the same people who were supposed to protect me, right? 
but I was also humiliated and abused as if I was their comic sort of, I don't know. I can't even explain to it. Grown, I'm not gonna curse, but grown people. Like how, what, what trauma were you going through that you wanted to do that to a little boy? Anyway, I was bullied as well as being humiliated and abused. I had to witness trauma experienced by losing a father and I had to grow up in a world without one. I had to learn and figure out my coping mechanisms. Not only that, but I had to find ways to use my weaknesses, such as my learning disabilities, to come out on top. Man, the, the school system, and a lot of teachers can probably count for this going you know 20 years ago when i was in school that there was a thing i forgot what the the terminology was but it was basically you couldn't leave no kid behind right and they would just pass you and they knew i was struggling having issues and i couldn't read and they were just like screw it just pass them to the next grade and when i was like hey i need additional help the teachers at the time maybe could have been overwhelmed by how many students that they had in the classroom so they were just like, they couldn't dedicate the time to me. So I just got, I, I fell between the cracks. I got left behind in, in areas that I needed more nurturing. I needed more that teaching. And the school system at that time felt me there and felt me in middle school. And, and it was some little issues in high school, but I had some really good teachers that, um, that came in and, um, uh, yo, they did the right thing. They, for once, I had learned that, you know, I had a couple people in middle school and even like one person and um, like a few people in elementary, but it, it was a lot of negative uh, experiences that I experienced from uh, elementary, uh, middle school. It wasn't really, I didn't really have any really issues with the teachers, but it, it, once again, I wasn't being, I wasn't being taught what I needed when I had an IEP and they were supposed to be doing these things. And then once I got to high school, yo, I had some, I had some teachers, I had some superheroes some people that just that came in and made it okay for me to trust. Shout out to all the teachers that do that. Shout out to the people that go up and beyond because I had some evil people came in and made it okay for me to trust. Shout out to all the teachers that do that. Shout out to the people that go up and beyond because I had some evil people that that weren't being loved and they were taking it out on me. Can you imagine going through life at a young age and thinking, oh, I jumped ahead. This part, this part hit home. And this is another part that I'm gonna talk about normalizing men's trauma and that my vulnerability does not challenge my masculinity. And I'm gonna talk about this because I'm strong enough to say this and I'm strong enough to talk about it and I can smile about it because I've overcome. I've gotten this far, I've done so much. For all the people that know me, I've done so much. Hold on, hold on. It's just a moment of, uh, of excitement in my voice. It's good to smile, man. It's good to smile. It's good to smile. Congratulate yourself. Pat yourself on the back. You know, just say that you went through challenge after challenge after challenge, journey after journey after journey, after betrayal after betrayal, betrayal, after hardship after hardship, and you came up on top. Appreciate. Appreciate y'all watching me. Appreciate y'all listening to me. I'm gonna go and talk about this part real quick. So I came in and I talked about the learning disability, right? But this one, this one took me the longest to talk about. This one took me the longest to accept and to, to get over and to allow myself to heal, to be strong enough to even own the power to speak on it. And I feel like I want to dance. I want to I get up and... And, you know, 
I'm just glad that in this light, I can talk about it. That y'all can see me at my best. You can see the shine, the glow. Look at this. Cut my hair this morning and everything. I'm feeling good. Because I knew I was going to talk about these topics. And I wanted to really help people and men normalize their trauma. Normalize other people's uh, trauma and their issues. And I want to talk about it. How could I be a motivational speaker if I can't talk about my own issues? That I couldn't talk about my triumphs. If I couldn't tell you about my own trauma. Right? So that spoke deep to me. And I said, I got to go hard in the paint. I got to get up. And I got to really talk about some stuff. And I got to shed some light on stuff. And really help y'all. And really help motivate y'all, inspire y'all. But from a harder, deeper place. Because most people say that you can't really be a motivational speaker until you really talked about gravitating to wealth. You don't need no wealth to talk about that. Just listen to me. I'm telling you right now. Watch. Just listen to this. Not only did I go through humiliation, abuse, bullying, witnessing trauma, loss of a father, going and learning my own coping method and nigga. Now I'm getting that tongue-tied situation, learning my own we uh my own coping mechanisms, weaknesses from my learning disability, the betrayal of adults and teachers. This is the hard one. Just listen to this. I had to I had to learn how to hear and to speak as well. I also had to go through the betrayal of frenemies, frenemies. People you think they're close to you and they're your friends, but they're not. Frenemies. And that I couldn't even trust those people. Broken relationships that I went through and also being cheated on. And I'm not, I'm not attacking nobody or nothing like that. I know people were going through in this situation, but I'm not also condoning what those people did too. And and you, and when I talk about the subject about broken relationships, it's because throughout time, you know, going through all these experiences, I wasn't in a safe space, nor did I ever feel comfortable around other people because of what happened to me and experiences that I went through. So I probably fell into relationships with other people who also had similar issues, which they say that sometimes they say opposites attract. But for me, I was attracting other people that also went through similar issues with me. And I'm not attacking y'all in any way. I'm just talking about my truth and about why I fell into situations that maybe I shouldn't have put myself into. Maybe I should have owned up to mistakes that I made and also things that I was dealing with that I couldn't really talk on, that I couldn't speak on, that I was holding on because we told to be men. We told to not cry, you know, all these things. My mom didn't teach me that. My mom told me, no, cry if you got to. She told me, no, talk about your truth, talk about your man. But that was because maybe I was just raised by her and it's different scenarios when you're being raised by both parents. I don't know what it is. I only had one mother, one superhero in my life that did it. Most people have two, most people don't even have any. You know, so I'm just glad for who I got. So I'm going to talk about it. I had to learn how to hear and to speak. I also had to go through the betrayal of frenemies and that I couldn't even trust those people. Broken relationships and being cheated on. But the worst of all, the worst of all. I'm a superhero when I talk about this one, buddy. The worst of all. I was molested by my male cousin. Another person that I couldn't trust that was older than me, that betrayed me. Can you imagine going through life at a young age thinking that you're gay when the whole time you was just being raped? I own those. I own those words now. Wow. I hope you feel the power in those words when I spoke them. If you see this, foot this footage, this video, I hope you see the power in those words when I spoke them. Talk about pain, talk about trauma. Even suicide haunted my mind for years, but I came up on top because I was strong and I knew I had to live to tell my story. I was in rough places throughout life. All the way up from the day I was basically, I almost died in my mother's, um, during my mother's, uh, uh, during the birth of my time because um, I was in hospital and Nazareth Hospital at the time, and it was just really bad hospital. It's probably really bad now, too. Me and my mother almost died. Um, she lost all our blood. She was hemorrhaging and all this stuff. 
and the umbilical cord, the umbilical cord was wrapped around my neck, on my neck, and I, um, I lost air, but I don't know how much, but I almost died. She almost died too. So just from the, just from the date of me coming out, to to experiencing my father get killed, to then to go through what my cousin did to me, to then go through being bullied, to then being betrayed by teachers, to then find out your friends or actually your frenemies to then go through broken relationships, to then go with learning disabilities. Oh, I climbed, I climbed, and I climbed, and I climbed, and I got all the way up. That's powerful. And for the suicide part, suicide of thoughts wise, I, I had the right to be in mental states in my mind and experiences that I went through that tested me and I'm glad that I'm here today this was uh well over um I haven't any I haven't had any of those thoughts and this is well over about maybe um seven or eight years ago but I remember from like basically back from that basically that time all the way until like in uh high school and then well all the way until uh, elementary what I was going through uh, me me being um, sexually molested and things of that nature, me, my sexuality being questioned, um, me being torn between worlds, not knowing if I was straight or gay, if I was bisexual, um, me, uh, me just going through those situations and putting myself in situations that the part that broke me more in those moments is that at that time, you're thinking that this is what you do to people. When, when the predator is doing things to you, you then think this is normalized. And then you think that this is what you are. And I'm not attacking anyone. I love everybody, right? I got a lot of love for anybody. And I'm just saying for my situation, that experience was totally unneeded. And the experiences that occurred after it, the couple of years afterwards, me um, not knowing if I was gay or straight, and mostly thinking that, you know, I was attracted to men because, or boys at the time, because, of what my cousin was doing to me and then you know eventually once i got to like older into like um uh like i think right, right around like third grade like i after that experience i was like i love girls damn they beautiful <laughs> i was just like wow man you know the the beauty of them you know and that and that, that never changed i just throughout the course of life you know all the way up until now i've been in the pursuit of women and but you know for me to have to go through that and experience that and that was that was tough and I, who knows what happens to people and what um throughout their life but i just want to normalize men talking about their trauma and you listen to my story and see where i got to and how i got here so you know that took a long time for me to own those words and talk about it to even put it on camera to stand here and talk about it um but you know for people who are of whatever you are and all the people that are experiencing the whiplash of being transgender um you know the binary um uh, uh the whole um lgbtqt uh, community um you know much love for you and it's just it's sad that in a world that you can't be your own your own self and for me things were taken from me and things were done to me that i couldn't protect myself against um, and now I'm so strong at a place that nobody can do anything to me that could break me, that could hurt me because I love myself too much. Now, once I built that love, that foundation, and this is what I'm saying, learning inside the book, this is what I gained. So this is something that you should gain as well. Just listen to my experiences and you'll understand. So I'm going to go back into death. I need I needed courage, wisdom, love, joy, happiness, and strength because I needed to save as many people as possible. I needed to be strong enough to pick up the pieces and put them back together. Whether if you were broken or not, I am here to show you how to be loved because no one around me during those times besides my family loved me. I couldn't trust the teachers. I couldn't trust my friends. I couldn't trust the situations that I was put in. You know, so all those things really altered me through my adult going up into my adulthood but from you know from that point once i gra when i grabbed a hold of myself and i said hold up homie you about to be amazing 
you about to be strong. You about to empower people. You're going to change lives. You're going to save lives. I had some friends that they didn't make it to this day. Some people that they took their own life. And I'm, and I'm, it's sad and it's, it hurts me at times that I couldn't save them. But I saved me first so I could then help with whoever else I can. But see, I had a handful of people who protected me and showered me with love because I needed it more. My mother was my gladiator, sword in hand and shield. She would protect me. I'm gonna say that one more time. My mother was my gladiator, sword in hand with shield. She would protect me. During the times that she was on television and I was being humiliated because she was in court fighting for my father's justice. Let me just say something. Kids, watch what you do. Kids, watch what you do. They, they watch their parents, what they're doing. They're modeled after your actions. Most of kids who are being, who are bullying me, were being harmed at homes, either by abuse or they were being molested. Be kind to them. They're fragile. Protect them and watch what you say around them because words deliver massive action. If you all day belittle them, it breaks them inside. And what do they do? They go out and they're angry. You're beating them. And they go out and beat people like me. People that at the time I was so small, innocent. I mean, it would, they were beating me, like beating me up, throwing me in trash cans, dumping me into water, um, into the toilet. I mean, I went through some, some degrading stuff, being stomped on, spit on. Mm. But I'm strong, baby. So here. Just remember, she told me that I would never amount to be anything. Yet see, I became a warrior. A making of a genius. Let's get back into the story. Define your triggers to control the responses you allow people to have. Life is a personal development course of correction. There will be errors and mistakes, but don't blame yourself too much. Congratulate yourself during your journey of learning. Give yourself props on making improvements in yourself. Don't allow your triggers to make you overreact. Have you heard of the proactive formula? The proactive formula. Formula. I don't know why I couldn't say that word for a second. It comes from the Jewish. It comes from the Jewish. It comes from the Jewish messianism called Kabbalah, which teaches the practice of changing our behavior from reactive to proactive. This will help you with taking control of your decision making to have what you truly desire in life. There is another method of unblocking your barriers to access the light inside your shell so that you can achieve what you naturally want in life in a proactive way. Here are some key steps that I've learned from her book, which teaches you her ways of proactive, the proactive formula. Step one, pause and observe your reaction. Oh, st sorry. Step one, pause and observe your reactive nature. Step two, the obstacle, in not, the obstacle is not the problem, but how you react to the situation is. Step three, you must understand that this roadblock in life was given from a higher divine being to challenge your growth. You are the seed and the fertilizer is the process of blossoming you into a flower. I'm gonna say it one more time. You must understand that this is the this roadblock in life was given from a higher divine being to challenge your growth. You are the seed and the fertilizer is the process of blossoming you into a flower. Step four, ask your higher self for help to allow the necessary changes for a proactive solution. You can say, please give me the courage to handle the situation with a clear mind to make the healthier choices that fit my purpose. Step five, choose the proactive choices until you are calm and centered. This will give us a moment of clarity to say the right things in the heat of a moment, in the heat of moment, in the heat of the moment. Become the one with there's a quote here, become one with your inner self. If you accomplish this task, you will make better decisions when a past emotion is clouding your judgment or how you believe the situation is treating you. Pause 
and deserve. That's another quote. Here's another section where she talks about what are soul traps? One, comfort. When things seem perfect from the outside but are horribly wrong inside, you must understand that sacrificing long-term happiness for a temporary feeling of comfort will not suffice your soul. <laughs> Step two, I must have spoke some truth to that bird. That crow was up. Step two, fantasy. Counterfeit gold is when you predetermine the characteristics of someone or something ideal and project those characteristics onto something lesser. If you use your spiritual eye to undress the image in front of you, you will find the red flags of this counterfeit gold that seems shiny from the outside. But from the inside, that book is torn and unreadable. You are only... You only want real gold and not the illusion that showcases qualities that aren't tangible. Step four, what if? Don't fall into the potential trap hoping that they make change or could become better. Waiting around will close the doors. He's going off. Waiting around will close doors on your real gold. Step four, being too nice. You need to communicate what you deserve. Don't say, don't say quiet, hoping it will become better. It's been, I've been the victim of this trap myself, which has taught me that you have to maintain a certain level of selfishness. Don't give all of you hoping that it will please that person in your direction. This is something that we all have to perceive that this could be the reason your past relationships didn't work very possible for me because you both weren't communicating what you needed instead you allowed the relationship to be one-sided until it became toxic claiming your own faults and learning to be better in the next stage of your life or relationships own it grow from it because marriage material is learned also don't be nervous to step into that empowerment space to advocate for what you need early on Set those boundaries. That's something that I had to learn. Set my boundaries, learn my selfishness, speak up, uh, advocate what I need, um, and, and don't be the person that just blaming because the relationship didn't work for that reason. I had to learn from all that. That's something that we all need to take from this book. I'm a better man now than I was before, and that's the point of growth. I'm a better person that would be in a relationship now because I had to learn from that past mistakes. I had to learn from what issues that I was putting into the relationship so that I can be better for the next person. We have to learn how to do those things. Otherwise, you just keep making a domino effect. You keep doing the same thing over and over. Marriage at the mar marriage, at the marriage, relationship at the relationship, whatever it is. Job at the job. Thinking you are too much. Don't place yourself in someone's checklist or small box small box embrace yourself and live by your own terms be naturally authentic that's something that she says six law of attraction the bigger disclaimer you need to be aware of you are not responsible for attracting your own trauma right i wasn't responsible for attracting the things that happened to me but you are responsible for what um, situations you put yourself in to allow to have someone do something to you. So you also have to be responsible for who you trust, right? That's another big part. But maybe that person lies in the beginning and, we, and you don't know. But that's why there's red flags that pop up that you need to listen to. As soon as I see red flags and anyone that I'm talking to or a, a, a friend or, or anybody, I'm dipping because I've learned that now. That I haven't I'm not going to be the nice person. I'm not going to please you. I'm not going to be like, oh, maybe I can convince them. Maybe I can uh, Maybe I can see the potential in them. Maybe I can change them. I stopped all that. That's out the window, baby. Let me see right here. Using shame and blame won't help your healing process. The psyche is far too complex to put the law of attraction in front of it. Step seven, self-doubt. When you believe that you're not good enough, you have to have self-belief. Pessimistic people during our life who engender self-doubt tend to linger thoughts throughout our adult life. This can dis diminish your self-confidence. 
This has also been a hard battle for me to keep as well as claiming my own ownership of self-confidence due to my past traumatic experiences. But this has also been a learning experience that I'm slowly improving from. Don't subscribe to that type of energy or self-doubt and don't listen to that negative voice. You must become louder than that negativity. Christine recommends using artwork to capture what your soul trap symbolizes as a token of awareness so that you can see what you look like when you act out. My ways of documenting those soul traps to register how I was feeling was in the form of poetry and art, and you can take that in any way you want to. In most cases, when you have a harmful experience, I fight the, oh, sorry, sorry. In most cases, when you have a harmful experience, the flight fight or flight kicks in, preventing us from feeling or processing that moment. You need to create a meditation space to find those buried emotions. While deep in meditation, you can record yourself voicing out your emotions for self-help or to evaluate with your therapist. So get in front of the camera, just like how you're watching this video um, or listen to this audio, get in front of the camera, record yourself, um, close your eyes, meditate, uh, meditate and talk out loud. And then if and then go back and watch it and be like, dang, or just watch yourself how you talk, your the the facial expressions that you're giving yourself. Are you smiling? Right? Um, things like that of that nature. And then if you have a if you need help, go go see a therapist. You know, it, it's not I had some situations with therapists in the past that rubbed me wrong. But as I got older and then, you know, and you know, that's because I was younger and it was a lot of stuff happening to me and I didn't trust a lot of people. So I had I had reasons to keep people, you know, off to the side. I'm like, oh. I don't trust the devils. I know what happened, you know. So, and then at our, as I got older, I started um, gaining more trust. But I, I still keep people reserved because um, people know as your experiences go, go on, and I know. I said, look, I've been through it, and I ain't gonna keep putting myself in situations to allow people to do it to me. All right. Christine speaks on her topic about the soul voice which is about gaining control of that inner voice and being patient when finding this new relationship with your soul voice. One, you can connect with your intuitive. Let me read that again. You can connect with your intuition using dream work. Her method, method is basically telling yourself before going to sleep that you're going to sleep. Dream. And to remember, I tried that the uh, like two nights ago, and I said I'm gonna have a really positive dream. And I forgot exactly what I was um, telling myself in the dream, but I said I'm gonna dream, I'm gonna remember this, and it's gonna be positive. And I, and in the dream, it was just nothing but adventure. And right, so what she says is in this process, she says to remember. She also talks about using a journal to write down this process three times before going to sleep, and then you can use this tool to record what you dreamt about. I do similar practices using my phone and doing a similar meditation before sleep. That's something that I do. Telling myself and allowing to create a happy space to have peace during my REM stage. Hoping to create a space where I can dive deep in sleep since I tend to struggle with sleeping at night. Um, I would, I don't, like they had like, I had a bunch of stuff, different things, but basically I got, um, it's like chronic um, or traumatic um, insomnia that uh, from past things that happened to me that I still experience because the anxiety pops up. It's almost similar to like, um, what do they call it? Uh, having, um, having, um, uh, um, I can't remember the sleeping condition now. It, it, it will, it'll come back to me, but it's the sleeping condition that where as you're in sleep, you basically feel like you can't breathe. And y'all probably gonna be like, yo, I know what you're talking about. Like, and then drop it in the comments and all that other stuff. But yeah, I can't think of the, the terminology of it right now. But for the insomnia part for me, um, that was my issue and that comes on. Okay, step two. There's a reference that she speaks about that Dr. Clarissa um, Pencola Estes has developed, which is called Dream Analytics. it's called dream analyst basically you want to write down your dream that you remember and then cross out not, um nouns that was in the dream 
This will help you find a deeper understanding of what this dream might be trying to tell you. Typically when you dream, your soul slash spirit is off on a journey in other realms, worlds, and timelines, picking up clues for you to find later. Step three, if you believe in a higher power or the spirit, then using signs to help you make decisions when you're feeling stuck in another great is another great tool to exercise. When, when you are using the spirit, it could be a loved one that has passed on. Examples that she uses is asking the spirit to show you a sign using a blue bird on what decision you need an answer with an exact date. This is how this this, however, takes practice in time. There, these are the forms of finding courage from a higher divine or a spirit um, form. Four, another tool is asking your body what it needs. Your body holds all the secrets and wisdom which you can tap into using meditation. Here's a simple way you can use a process of holding you, uh, by, holding, um, by holding one hand on your belly and the other across your heart and chest. And then in the steps, this is what she says. I'm not, I can't close my eyes because I need to read this, but you can close your eyes and listen. Breathe in and out three times with your eyes closed and ask whatever question you need with a yes or no. When you feel an expansion, it's a yes. But if there is a feeling of tension or contraction, then it's a no. This book is powerful, man. Y'all gotta get this book. Y'all gotta get this book. Y'all gotta read this for yourselves. I just wanted to give y'all the, the, the stuff about it. I just wanted to tell you about it, put you on. Another simple way is using, this is step five. Another simple way is using a yes or no when asking if you want to eat or drink that certain item. This will help you build up that body awareness, how we can normalize emotions. And this is a basically, it's a question in a, in a, a statement at the same time. Um, the, how we can normalize emotions. When you're on a journey for healing, the process tends to hold hiccups along the way. There aren't smooth surfaces when building back those foundations. She brings up a part about her diagram. And it's called pre contemplation I'm gonna say, I just butchered the ickery out of that word. And I said this word the other day and I was just like, what? And then like, I went, you know, I had to say it over and over because it held so many different like syllables in the words when I'm looking at it. Remember, I'm dyslexic now. So, so as I'm looking at it, I'm like, that looked like Greek. I'm like, what am I looking at? Right, so uh, it's pre-contemplication which is basically a form of denial. And then there's contemplation, uh, which means you're aware of the situation, but you don't, uh, you don't want change. Then there's pre-preparation. You want change and you look to take action. There's action. There is, a, uh, and this basically means that there is an active um, uh, modification of behavior. That's the chickens in the background, you're crazy. Uh, maintenance. Um, sustain change in behavior that replaces the old. Relapse, when you pick back up on old habits or a series of behavior, upward spiral, that is the form of learning from each relapse that sticks and improves you from each chapter. Reset and recenter. A formula for getting back on track and normalizing emotions. Step one, write down your acting out behaviors that are affecting your self-esteem. These are all steps that I've done over time because I've, I've, I've read like psychology books before and um, videos on it because I didn't, I didn't feel comfortable going to a psychologist at a time or, or a therapist at a time uh, for my own reasons. Uh, step three, write down what behaviors are haunting, uh, that are hurting you or what could be harming you. Step four, You'll want to commit to making a decision that alters you, your, that alters you for the better. Step five, share that commitment with someone you trust. Step six, invite in, invite in your soul. That's a quote that she says. Ask your soul for help and guidance for the right shift. Ask 
the spirit to show you the way. Step seven, take a pause and write down your soul voice. This is a great tool for journalizing how your soul voice or how your inner you guides you as well as how it makes you feel. They probably feeling like they ain't got no attention over it. I'm gonna go see them later. Step eight, write down a daily act that you can do from preventing yourself from acting out bad behaviors. Step nine, you need to have the po you need to have positive self-talk. Give yourself the small pats, right? on the back during your small accomplishments. I always have positive talk with myself and because it's it's very, uh, it's an exercise, right? Telling yourself, yo, you did a good job today. And you killed that. You did that. Like, it's stuff like that. Things like that. Some things in the book she talks about is saying that, you know, baby girl, you did that. Like, she does like little sweet baby talks and stuff like that and tell yourself like, baby boy, you did this. Like, baby girl, you did that. Like, oh, you should, you empower me. You know, there's certain things that she says in the book um, that you should read and, and hear those um, the expressions and quotes and her rituals that she says. I don't want to take everything from the book, but my job in this suit of understanding the book and journalizing it for myself and, and then allowing you to listen to it uh, for the podcast wise and for footage wise is to see how I improve over a course of reading those books and what it should do for you and challenge you. Maybe you should then go out and do it. But maybe you'll just listen to this and just say, maybe that's good enough. But what I want you to do is still have these books in your library. Give credit to these people. I've given credit to them. I've bought their books. I've listened to their stuff. I just want to talk about them. You need to have positive self-talk. Give yourself small pats on the back during your small accomplishments. Step 10, make a list of things that you're proud of yourself for. Pick three things that meant the most to you. Um, and then here goes another step that she talks in the chapter. She says, uh, this is uh, making high standards. There's nothing wrong with having high values for yourself. Ask yourself, are you treating yourself like a secret soul altar? That's a question. Are you allowing the people in your space to bring sweet words of honey? And are they respecting you? I had to write that one down. I said, ooh, she did her thing right there. Christine did her thing, right? Um, I got to say that again. Are you allowing the people in your space to bring sweet words of honey? <laughs> All right, let me start. Uh, that was a good one. You have to be able to elaborate that you deserve to be treated like a divine being, that you are worthy of being a goddess or god, godlike. Hold on one second. Phone starting to check out on me. Might have to do a round two. Don't settle. You will have more respect for yourself and those around you will have more respect for you. Your body is a temple. So watch out for the dirty feet that try to slip through. Clean those feet at the door. Check that. Find someone who uplifts you. Someone who makes you feel excited to be you and with you. Like, I'm going to be a hype man. Like, it's stuff like that. You want that person to be the hype man. Like, all right, look. Like, how they say, okay, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about this real quick. How they say that. I heard a woman say this before because um, I, I follow a lot of people. I like, to, I like to put in my space a lot of positive people. I try to uh, push out all the negativity in the world and any negative thoughts because there's a lot of people that are negative, people that are grouchy, um, evil in their own ways. And I try to avoid all that because it's not good to your... Uh, self growth. Get rid of that out of your. Try to surround yourself with as many entrepreneurs in your space, as many um, influencers, uh, travel groups, and many things that can widen your perspective and allow you to see things, even if you're in a bad neighborhood or wherever you're at. Right. Allow yourself to venture off with them and and allow them to feed and pour into you. So another thing that I want to talk about is that what she said. This uh, influencer, she basically said that when you come into a relationship, there should not be you make me whole. Us two coming together make us whole. It should be one plus one makes three. And if we leave the relationship, we're both whole, right? So that made me think about that part when she's talking about find someone that hypes you up. You need to be whole when you come into a relationship and that person needs to be whole. And when y'all both whole and y'all both respect yourself and you both got your boundaries, y'all gonna hype each other up, right? Don't allow yourself to be soul sick which is the results from 
overindulging from a temporary uh, comfort, for temporary comfort. List down the people who are no longer available for you, right? That you checked out of your life and said, you know what, that's too much negativity. That's too much, you know, uh, BS in my life. I don't need you. Write down those people and say, and just, and, and, and debuff them from your life. That's basically what he, what she's saying. Write down the things you are now available for because you're, you've removed the negative energy from your lifestyle. And then she says in this chapter, this is the chapter of cultivating healthy. What are healthy signs of a healthy human? That's the question she says. And that was like, that really hit me. What are signs? What No, what are healthy signs of a healthy human? <laughs> then she goes in about it because she said she spent so much time talking about red flags and things of that, of that nature. What are the green signs? What are the green flags? What, what are you going to tell me about that? Right. So then here she goes. She says, you want to be aware. This is what I interpreted, interpreted from the book and my thoughts. You want to be aware, and her thoughts too. I'm not taking any other information. You know, I'm just saying, uh, let me just get into it, right? What are healthy signs of a healthy human? You want to be aware of what the green indicators are instead of the red flags. And then she says, here's a list. Christine has charted out for us, right? Find people who have their own hobbies that respect your own interests. Allow your interests to grow, right? And for me, my hobby, I got a bunch of hobbies. So I have my own hobbies and the other person has to have their own hobbies, right? Then find a person who has their own alone time and that they have respect for your alone time. I value my alone time. I might not be want to be all up on you all, at all times. And maybe I need space to go out a day or two by myself, do, do a day trip for me and things of that nature, right? And then she says, you also want to find a person who speaks with a calm and passionate tone. The one who respects all walks of life and backgrounds. These are the good signs. These are the green flags that you should be looking for. You need to find someone who is open-minded and someone who is also patient. Some of us have not been taught boundaries as well as those who have non-existing boundaries. These are the people who let someone just walk all over them. The true definition of people pleasers. I said I can't be that no more. Right? You have to, and you have to own those things once you get to that part. And it says here in the second, there are also people who have a very rigid boundaries who are afraid of letting someone in. Christine also has a part where she's talking about her methods on what she calls the balance boundary. This is like someone having a veil between each other that allows you to have that boundary of balance. You must learn the art of saying no nicely. And this is what she's talking about. Here's an example. You can tell someone you would love to go, but you have too much on your plate, but have an absolutely amazing time. You want to avoid saying yes when it really means a no. This is a disingenuous representation of yourself and can be harmful to your counterpart. Book is almost done. Uh, I, I told you it took me a, almost a whole week just to read this and listen to this. Because I couldn't just listen and read and I would read and I'd be like, oh, snap, she just dropped nuggets. And I'm like, whoa, that just like really, it was really intense and powerful. So here she goes right here. She said, you want to avoid, um, oh, she already said that. I already said that. She has many other scripts in the book that allow you um, to use during any life situation. Here's another example that she talks about. You can practice with using a vision board to attract the things you desire in life. But avoid using flashy, flashy things. Also, you want to trust your natural feelings when placing your energy in this vision board. So I have my own vision board that I made for myself, and I practice this um, in my sense religiously. And you can practice whatever you want religiously, but I just use that spiritual connection and my vision to, and I'm going to go talk into it. And I also use the vision board myself for a healthy and a continuous reminder to keep me focused, accountable, and responsible for my actions. And this is for me to sum up what the book has taught me. I've come to learn and to relearn the meaning of loving me and speaking my truth, which has released me of my soul trap, especially since we are our, our own, that we are our own soul doctor. And I'll say that one more time. I've come to learn and to relearn the meaning of loving me and speaking my truth, which has released me of my soul trap, especially since we are our own soul doctors. And then she comes in and talks about a part of Hindu. It's called it's, uh, meditation. Mantra is a Hindu 
form of meditation. And this is a more playful and effeminative and relaxing way to introduce to your lifestyle. Um, this one's called, this is the mantra is called uh, Lalitha. I probably pronounced that wrong. Uh, mantra. Lala, Lalitha, ma, now I can't say the word. <laughs> Lalitha Mantra. This is how the song goes. And she's basically saying that you want to repeat the song over and over while you meditate. And this is the part, right? Lalitha Mantra. Oh, phone dipped on me. Let's see if I can remember the part that she talks about. The phone died. And I was going to record this last part. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure that, and I'm probably going to butcher it because I don't have it in front of me. But basically how the words went was like, it was like, la, no, no, sorry. It was, uh, it was like, I think it was ha, e, i, sa, la, kai, he. And then she would go again and repeat it. And it would be like, ha, sa, la, kai, he, ha, la, sa, kai, he. And it was multiple parts in the section of it. Um, I'm probably going to have to record this song on, on another take. Um, but she basically repeats this um, mantra and listens to it. And they say it over and over in their form of their meditation. Um, and I wish I had <laughs> just, just ran out of time. But look, um, this is my journey to growth. As I said, with um, modern nobility, the reason why I created it was to challenge me because you need to set real challenges. I already spoke about this before on that you, if you, if, how, how should I refer, how should I phrase this? Essentially what I'm saying is when you set challenges in life, set the small ones, then set the big ones, right? And you need to set tangible things in those ways. Um, and some of the tangible ways you can do that is when I did it with my vision board. And basically in her case, my, my also, um, acting out responsibility and keeping myself accountable and setting high limits to try to reach to say to, to, to tell me and myself and tell y'all that I'm going to read a hundred books or listen to a hundred audio books in any form, shape and size in 90 days. That just seems quite challenging, right? That's like a book a day, right? No, that's more than a book a day. That's a book and a half a day. In certain, in some certain spots that you do, man, depending on what you do, but it's like a book in a quarter a day to read a hundred books in that time frame. And, I, and you can't just you got a two hundred page book. You 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 going in, and I'm I'm doing stuff throughout the week, and I'm just doing this in my small amounts of time to challenge myself, to stimulate my mind, to to uplift myself, to embrace things that I didn't know. And to then challenge myself by setting these targets that even if I miss them, I'm okay because I pushed past the limits. I set unreachable goals that I thought that I, could, I couldn't I could do, right? That's why you set a high limit to then eventually hope that you, with the terminology is what they say is, shoot for the stars, you might land on the moon, right? Shoot high enough that, that you reach your target that you really wanted. So my target was to basically say, I'm gonna charge my, challenge myself to read more books than I ever read before. And that I knew that the average entrepreneur, I mean, the average CEO reads uh, between 50 and 60 books a year. And I knew, I said, okay, that's basically about a, uh, a book a week, right? Um, because it's 52 weeks in a year, they're probably reading about a book a week. Now, if they're, they're reading a, like a little bit more than that, maybe a book and a quarter, uh, just a, or two books every then and now, or every now and then to catch up to those 60 uh, books, right? But they have more time to do it. So then I figured, I said, no, we got time too to do this. We, we, we just have to figure out where we can place it in our time. You know, when, when you're, you know, you got five minutes, you're waiting for your food to be done uh, in the microwave or, or whatever, you know, the oven is cooking or you're washing clothes. Whenever you're doing something that is taking time away from you and you don't have another action to put in place, pick up the book, read it, do something, work out. It's multiple different things that you can use to challenge yourself because you have 24 hours in a day and that's a lot of time. I mean, most of it is used up because you're probably working and sleeping and getting back and forth to work, but you still have those dead spaces of time where now it's your time and you can do what you want. Like me coming outside and recording this video, enjoying this weather. I'm knocking out two birds at once and I'm, I'm, I'm bringing completion to my self-development by challenging myself to do more things than what the norm is set for you because that's the only way that you do 
what they say is that's the only way that you do 90 that you do one percent of the 99 percent that people don't do is that they say that most people after they graduate from high school or even college hardly ever pick up another book right and because you were forced to learn education that you probably didn't want and then now once you got out you hardly want to challenge yourself in a way to learn more information and i remember a teacher told me she said you never stop learning after you leave school you never stop taking tests you never stop um um there's never stops of moments of challenges and quizzes and all that stuff and she was so right i'm always taking tests all the time throughout all my jobs or where i've been at i'm always challenging myself with new tasks and you're still always devouring and absorbing more information and knowledge it's just that different walks different paces in your life different places when you're doing it but basically that was my challenge and if i don't hit 100 books that's cool because if i hit 60 i did what the natural the normal or average ceo does in a whole year and i did that in 90 days that was my challenge if i can't hit 100 i'm gonna hit 60 if i can't hit 60 i'm gonna hit 30 just keep setting those imaginable um big numbers objectives and goals because if you can do 30 books in 90 days that means you can do 120 in a year which is double what the average ceo does so it just and, and the average person only reads maybe four books four to 12 books a year so appreciate you popping uh, tuning in to modern nobility the making of a genius and as i mentioned the breakdowns is um uh was a greatness extraordinary nobility integrity uniqueness or unique and successful peace